I just want to pray in the church. Why will I have to pay five euros? And he said, well, you know, this church is precious. It has all the works of Van Eyck, of Rembrandt, you know, the Flemish masters. You will not find this in any museum. And I said, I am not here to, to look for the paintings of Van Eyck or the paintings of Rembrandt. I just want to visit the church and pray. And he smiled at me and he said, Sir, if you want to pray, there is a little side chapel over there. You don't have to pay. Just enter that side chapel. I was disappointed. So, isn't it obvious that the faith in many instances is dying? The door of faith is not open, it's closed. And Pope Francis, or Bergoglio, said, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says he is at the door and knocks. Obviously, the text refers to him knocking from outside in order to enter. And now he turns it upside down. He says, but I think about the times in which Jesus knocks from within so that we will let him come out. They want, the, the cardinals almost, almost, almost fell from their chairs, from their seats when he said this. What is he saying? Para ang kumakatok sa pintuan ng simbahan, hindi para pumasok, kundi para lumabas. Kasi kinukulong natin si Jesus sa simbahan. They were shocked. <laughs> suddenly, you know, there's this guy who's talking like this, and he's a cardinal, and they were shocked to let Jesus out. He says, the self-referential church keeps Jesus Christ within herself and does not let him out. Kinulong niya. Kinulong natin si Kristo sa loob ng simbahan. And so he says, yeah, it's good to celebrate a year of faith, but let's get real. We have to celebrate the faith in a context in which people have become faithless. That our churches are not so welcoming, so attractive anymore. And then, third paragraph, he says, when the church is self-referential, inadvertently, she believes she has her own light. She stops being the Mysterium Lunae. That is Latin. Mysterium Lunae means the mystery of the moon. You know the mystery of the moon? What is the mystery of the moon? The mystery of the moon is that it is bright even if it has no light of its own. Where does the, the, moon, the moon's light come from? From the sun. It is reflected light. That is why it's a very gentle kind of light. That's the mystery of Lune. And he says the church is like a moon. The church must reflect the light of Christ. But when the church begins to believe that she has her, her own light, then she stops being the mystery of the moon. She grows dark and gives way to that very serious evil, he says, of spiritual worldliness, which according to Henry de Luba, a great uh, uh, French theologian is the worst evil that can befall the church, a spiritual worldliness. Para contradiction in terms of spiritual worldliness. Because if you are spiritual, you will transcend the world. Spirituality is always beyond this world. But if your whole preoccupation is about only this world. 
then you have become spiritually worldly, says the Luba. And this is quoted by Bergoglio. It lives to give glory only to herself, to itself. And in many instances in church history, that has happened. Ang simbahan na walang ginawa kundi tumawag pansin sa sarili. The church that tended to behave like an empire. And then, nakalimutan na natin what it means to build a church. Wala tayong ginawa kundi magpagandahan ng simbahan, palakihan ng simbahan, pabonggahan ng simbahan. Nabanggit ni Dr. Rosselli that we're building mission stations in the Diocese of Caloocan. Why? Because I cannot build parishes. Paano ko magtatayo ng parokya sa slums? In some of our slums, you would have easily around 35,000 people. Isang slum area na mo. Slum community. Paano ko magtatayo ng simbahan doon? Kung ang concept of parokya is magputap ka ng simbahan. But we have forgotten that to build the church doesn't necessarily mean build a building. The church is the people of God. The church is the community of the faithful. The church is a community of disciples. So sabi ko, I don't care about building parishes. All I need is for the church to be present among the poor. It is love. As long as I have mission partners, who are willing to take the challenge of living with the poor. And lahat ng inipitahan ko na religious congregation, they said yes to my invitation. And now, I've opened about seven mission stations. And what are mission stations? Well, church presence among the poor. That's all. I send missionaries to live with the poor. Saan? The slums. Sa titira, in the slums. Whatever house I can rent. Nabayaran ko yung bahay. Kuryente, tubig. Ganon. Kung yung bahay, dibuhos lang yung toilet. Then may do with that. In the slums. And to be present with the poor, to bring the word of God to them, to organize basic inclusion communities. Yan lang. The last time I visited one mission station, at least that mission station, meron silang maliit na kapilya, parang buro lang lang napatay. At most, around 30 people could fit inside the kapilya. I celebrated Mass inside that kapilya, and I had around 30 people inside, but I had around 800 people in the street. Isn't that wonderful? Sa Santo Niño, inibitahan na po ni Doktora. At sa Urban Poor Community, Malabon. Inibitahan na po. And I think majority of the people were outside in the basketball court, in the street, like that, you know. And, and you celebrate Mass in that kind of a situation. And you'd be surprised, may choir ka pa, may lectors ka pa, mayroon ka pang... Uh, greeters, you know, complete that the ministries, including the lay ministers. So what prevents you from saying that there is a church there? Dahil pa walang simbahan? You say there is no church there? No, the church is there. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, says the Lord, there I am in the midst of them. Ayan ang madalas makalimutan natin. And now in Europe, you have those super huge, beautiful, uh, architecturally sophisticated cathedrals that are empty. And you say, where is the church? There. Oh, there is no church. There is a building that looks like a church. That is what's happening in many countries. Do you want that to happen to the Philippines? It can happen. And I tell you, if it happens, it's going to happen very fast. It's going to happen very fast. Most secularized 
so-called progressive societies usually end up being very anti-religious. Then you stop having vocations. Mga baby boomers po tayo eh. Mga baby boomers. Sa generation ng mga baby boomers, maraming members ng family. Kami nga, labing tatlo magkakapatid, seven boys, six girls. And surprisingly, of 13 children, isa lang nagpare, walang nagpadre. But it's good enough na isang vocation na tumubo dun sa pamilya. Of course, pag mas malaki yung pamilya, there is a greater likelihood na, you know, may tutubong vocation dyan. Pero ngayon, dalawa, you know, tanongin mo nga agad, may gusto bang magpare dito? May gusto bang magmadre dito? Alam niyo ba, pag wala na yung generation natin, the next generation that is coming is not going to produce vocations. And the church is going to die. Do you want that? So what do, we, what do we do about it? This is the challenge of Pope Francis. We all are dreaming of becoming a progressive society. It will come with a cost. Put simply, says Pope Francis, there are two images of the church. One, the church which evangelizes and comes out of herself. And he takes his inspiration from the Vatican II document, Dei Verbum, Religiose Audience and Fidente Proclamance. Listening and proclaiming the word of God. And, on the other hand, a worldly church, living within herself, of herself, for herself. And this should shed light, he says, on the possible changes and reforms which must be done for the salvation of souls. And finally, what does he expect of the next Pope? Isn't that funny, no? He is saying, things that uh, he did not realize with boomerang looking back to him. He says, what do I expect of the next Pope? He says, well, he should be a man whose contemplation and adoration of Jesus Christ helps the church to go out to the existential peripheries. Take note. He makes that very, very clear that if we are to go out to the existential peripheries, it's not because of activism. It's not because of any political motive or ideology. No, no. It's because of our contemplation and adoration of Jesus Christ. If we have really contemplated and adored the Lord Jesus Christ, He will push us out of our comfort zones into the existential peripheries. Says, so he says, uh, a man whose contemplation helps the church to go up. It helps the church to be the fruitful mother who gains life from the sweet and comforting joy of evangelizing. The joy of evangelizing. He always puts together joy and evangelization. Because for Pope Francis, you cannot call it evangelizing if it is not joyful. Then sabi niya, kung magdadala ka ng mabuting balita, dapat hindi ka mukhang biyari santo. Kung magdadala ka ng mabuting balita, you should look like Easter Sunday. You bring the joy of the risen Lord, not the grief of a dead Christ. No, no, the joy of resurrection, the joy of evangelizing. Okay, that's for challenge one. 
Now we move to challenge number two. Is that okay? So we're done with the first challenge. The challenge, the first challenge of renewal is to move, to grow from self-referentiality or from being a self-referential church to a church that goes out to the periphery. Now we move to challenge number two. Challenge number two, the challenge of renewal in the church, is to grow from a clericalistic church to a truly participatory church. And what's that, what does that mean? A church that empowers the laity to assume their proper roles in the mission of the church. Mission is not only for clerics, it's not only for the ordained. Kaya, when you have a parish priest who would not allow the laity to participate in the mission of the parish, then you have a clericalistic priest. When you have a parish priest who behaves like pari ako, hari ako, you know, then you have a clericalistic priest because he prevents the church from becoming truly participatory. Na para bang siya lang ang tumanggap ng Espiritu Santo. Lahat tayo tinanggap natin ng Holy Spirit at baptism. And the Holy Spirit is the gift of all gifts. When you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will empower you to discover your charisms. What is the difference between talents and charisms? Well, a charism is a talent that is used for service of the community. Because that all talented people are using it for the service of the community. You can be talented and you use it, you know, to make yourself popular, to enrich yourself. Don't call that a charism. It may be a talent, but not necessarily a charism. The gifts of the Spirit are not gifts for you. We are all gifted with gifts from the Spirit. But if the, if the gift comes from the Spirit, it's not for you. The Spirit will give you gifts that will be for the benefit of the upbuilding of the community, of the body of Christ. Um, you know, at San Roque Cathedral, I noticed, especially among the lectors, a tendency to, you know, to be so tight guarded. That's why they call their attention about it. And sabi ko, let us welcome naman, you know, some new volunteers. Because we need some we should be on the lookout for that, especially among our volunteers in the church. When they become irreplaceable, when they cannot even welcome new volunteers anymore, when they become a club that is happy together, barkada, a click, it's, it becomes impenetrable. Mahirap yan. So, understanding our vocabulary is very important, you know? and for this we have to define the major sectors of the church. The first major sector of the church is the laity. You are included among the laity. These are the members of the church who belong neither to the clergy nor to the religious, the so-called religious, members of religious congregations. Members of the community of the baptized, these are the so-called laity, the lay people. They are the majority in the Christian community. The second sector, obviously, would be the clergy. The clergy in the church 
are those members who are instituted for the ordained ministry. And we have three ranks of the clergy in the church. The bishops, the presbyters, and deacons. Kaya lang nasanay tayo tawagin silang pare, priests. And there's something wrong about that. Ako kinikilabutan ako when I'm called a priest. Because, strictly speaking, there's only one priest. Christ. The Supreme High Priest. And whatever is priestly that we perform as ordained ministers, it's mainly to act in the person of Christ, the priest. So, if I'm truly priestly, it is Christ acting, not me. And the ministry is not called priesthood, but presbytery. Well, no coordination to the priesthood. It's an ordination to the presbytery. Napaka-important ito ang vocabulary. And a presbyter means an elder. It comes from the Greek word presbyteros, which means mature in faith, an elder, an office holder. And the third rank is the office of deacon. Bishops, presbyters, and deacons. And they're supposed to work together under the team leadership of bishops. And leaders and bishops, the word episcopos or bishop means overseer, coordinator. Not one who lords it over. May may dumalo sa akin ng sabi niya, nasa ng palasyo mo, bishop? <laughs> I was shocked. Sabi ko, palasyo, alit ka sa bahay ko. Look at it. Tumuha mo palasyo. <laughs> Unfortunately, in some instances, bishops mimic palaces because they like to be presented like kings. E binibigyan nga kami ng trono eh. Kinukurot na pa nga kami eh. And some bishops believe that yung mitre is a crown. That the staff is a scepter. That, that the vestments are royal robes. At kung mahilig pa kayong magpamper sa amin, you will really make us, make us look like kings. Kaya, in history, maraming beses nag-deteriorate ang simbahan kapag ang mga obispo ay nagpugaling hari-harihan. And up to this day and age, that mentality is still very strong. When I was much younger, ang concept ko ng obispo yun. Tapos pipila, each one, luluhod pa, hindi lang pipila. Luluhod pa. And I remember very clearly the first time I saw a bishop being installed, I was shocked. Kailangan nakaupo siya, hawak niyang ganun yung kanyang staff. And then, nalapit lahat. And then, luluhod sa harapan niya para kumalik sa kanya. Sinsi. Nice. You're expressing uh, respect for the office. But why do we have to do it this way? Ito yung mga bagay na kinu-question ni Pope Francis. And, Nung naging Pope si Pope Francis, the first time he was asked to receive an audience, he was being asked to sit on a huge barrow chair na nagmumurang ginto. He looked at the chair and said, no, I don't like that. Get me another chair. Please get me another chair. Put that in the museum. It's already an antique piece, he says. We will not sell it. It's still part of the legacy of the church. But if I sit in that chair, I am making a statement. So I wouldn't want to sit in that kind of chair. And he refused to live in the papal palace. Kaya tumira siya sa Tamarca. 
Ang Santa Marta is a hostel, a hotel, the main cafeteria. So, at each time lalabas siya, iwan niya susi doon sa quarter. Kapahit siya sa cafeteria. May common chapel. That's it. Nung sabi niya, I'd rather live here in Santa Marta. Kasi mababaliw ako doon, nag-iisa lang ako doon yung sabi. At doon sa kabila, mas madali siya na sumin. <laughs> Very clever si Pope Francis, so that's why he decided. Because sometimes people will not be very happy about your decisions. And you're dealing with human beings around you, you know? It's always like that. So, we have the clergy. And the clergy has a very specific role and function of leadership in the church. But sometimes the clergy can get infected by the worldliness of worldly leaders. And they will tend to outdo sa pagkabongga ang mga worldly leaders. And it's not proper when you do that. When I celebrate Mass at San Roque Cathedral and sit in the Episcopal chair, shot ng lang pinalaki ng kilapit na ko. Ang laki ko na nga eh, dinobli pa yung laki ng 12 feet high at pinagawa nila yun. I remind myself that that chair belongs to Christ. That when I sit in that chair, I must disappear. That I must allow Christ to lead His church. That's the spirit. It should be like that. And finally, the religious, the third sector of the church. The CBCP declared this year as a year of the clergy and those in consecrated life, the so-called religious. Sino yung mga tinatawag natin religious? These are the members of the church who are called and instituted for consecrated life and are bound to poverty, chastity, and obedience. Ito yung tinatawag na evangelical councils. Ang mga religious, actually, were a later development in the history of the church. And they emerged precisely to balance the tendency of the clergy to lord it over. That's why they exaggerated yung mga the opposite extremes of the clericalistic leaders. I don't know if you have watched the film Brother and Sister Moon, the story of Pope of Saint Francis of Assisi. Remember Saint Francis of Assisi. Saint Francis of Assisi uh, started a mendicant order. Remember the beginning of his vocation was when he stripped himself naked and then put on. Uh, racks and he became a mendicant. He really exaggerated poverty and built a community that was living the evangelical causes of poverty, chastity, and obedience in a, an exaggerated way. That is why when he paid his respect to Pope Innocent III, and he was being barred because he didn't look decent enough. He was being barred entry. He was, you know, the, the cardinals wouldn't allow him in because they, they thought that uh, he wasn't following protocol about proper dress. But Pope Innocent called him in. And then uh, Pope Francis bowed before Pope Innocent. But according to the story, Pope Innocent returned the gesture and bowed before Francis and said, you put us to shame. 